Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Sunday matinee. We are on episode 27. We are still in the middle of Godzilla versus Kong. Um, it's out. It's on HBO Max. It's in cinemas. It's doing pretty well, even though I'm not going to go see it in a cinema quite yet. Um, but we're not going to talk about it just yet because I want people to have a chance to see it because it came out in the middle of the week when some of us are at work. Um, and I happen to know that one person on this panel hasn't seen it yet, and I need him to see it, not just because <laughs> I need him to talk about it with me, but because, you know, I know he's a big fan and, you know, yeah, whatnot. <laughs> so we'll be doing that next week. Uh, this week, we have a special bonus round to talk about in just a minute. But first, uh, let me introduce the panel. Welcome back. Travis, you have been uh through this entire adventure with me so it's good to have you here welcome back again thank you and uh fi finally finally coming back after the uh the first godzilla versus kong round is daniel draskovich i'm so sorry daniel that uh you had to miss last week because i had a scheduling issue with a theater thing i do yeah. so. <laughs> but it's yeah. good to have you here we're going to do a little bit of catch up with you because uh, I love to hear your opinions on all this stuff. Cool. Um, and uh, I, of course, am Ben Stahl. I am sorry to everyone out there if I'm looking a little more disheveled tonight than I do on most episodes. I uh, have just been off work for an hour and I didn't have time to clean up. And my day job is exhausting and terrible. Um, but with that, let's get to the news. Um, got a lot of comic book movie news going on this week and a little bit of star wars uh this one the first news by dropped like right before we recorded last week um so kind of missed that one i think we actually mentioned it really quickly when we were talking about dc but uh black adam is uh going to be coming to theater july 2022 starring dwayne johnson of course he's been attached to the role for a long time um but they finally got a cast rounded out and uh Really excited for this one. He is one of the DC's cooler anti-heroes. Um, sounds like he's going to probably be going a little bit more on the heroic side for this outing since they are going to have the Justice Society of America. But that doesn't mean he can't go bad for later movies. So that's going to be mm -hmm. exciting. Um, so uh, this week, the cast of the Obi-Wan Kenobi Disney Plus series was announced. Of course, we already knew that uh, Ewan McGregor and Hayden Christensen we're going to be uh, coming back to reprise the roles of Obi-Wan and Darth Vader, respectively. Um, I'm not going to list the entire cast, but uh, I can confirm that uh, we also have Joel Edgerton returning um, as Uncle Owen. I can't remember who plays Amp who played Amparu. I only remember Joel because he actually does other movies other than Star Wars um, and is a pretty cool actor. So, um, But they've got a really cool cast. Um, Kumal Nanjiani's in it, um, which is great to see him um, making the transition from stand-up comedy to Silicon Valley to now he's in Marvel and Star Wars. So good for him. Uh, speaking of Marvel, the cast of Thor Love and Thunder has gotten a little bit bigger this week with Russell Crowe uh, joining the cast in an un unspecified role. Um, we already have Christian Bale as the main villain, but uh, that doesn't mean we can't have more villains or maybe more heroes. Who knows? Oh, maybe he's Beta Ray Bill. That would be really cool. And looking forward to seeing Beta Ray Bill in the movies for a long time. Um, so back to Warner Brothers. Uh, speaking of uh, Godzilla versus Kong, Warner Brothers, I, they must have been impressed with what he did with that because Adam Wingard has been tapped by Warner Brothers to direct Thundercats, which is, of course, the, uh, the, <laughs> the classic Saturday morning cartoon from uh, when Daniel and I were <laughs> of the age to watch oh. that kind of stuff. So I, I hope that turns out good. Um, you know, so far for me, the track record with uh, those eight classic 80s cartoons going to live action hasn't been that great. I was not a fan of the first two Transformers films and dropped off that series after that. I heard Bumblebee was a major improvement, so I might have to check that out. Um, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping we get something good with Thundercats. Um, and guess what? Uh, it's it's another it's another week where we get movie delays. Not too many big ones this time around, though. These have all been delayed a week. Mortal Kombat 
has been delayed to uh, April 23rd. That's just coming up soon. That, of course, will launch on HBO Max. I'd like to think they pushed it back to give Godzilla a little extra breathing room mm -hmm. because uh, I'm not going to lie. Once Mortal Kombat comes out, I have a feeling that's what everyone who has HBO is going to be watching because uh, it's got a lot of hype and it's not going to matter how good or bad it is. People are going to watch it. Um, Venom, Let There Be Carnage has been delayed again. Again, only a week this time to September 24th. And what may be the most delayed movie we've talked about on this show Uncharted, stalling, starring Tom Holland as Nathan Drake, has been delayed once again, this time only a week, to February 18th, which means that I will not be seeing that on my birthday. Darn. Um, one movie that has actually gotten delayed considerably longer is uh, Resident Evil, Welcome to Raccoon City, the reboot of the uh, franchise that's based on the popular video game series. It's been pushed back from September to the end of November, which is rough because uh, that means they're going to miss that perfect Halloween opportunity to cash in on people who want to go see a scary movie in October. Mm -hmm. I'm still excited for it, though, because it is definitely looking more like the video games than the last batch of films ever did. All right. So uh, speaking of uh, big franchises that we never thought would be would be big franchises. Netflix has acquired the Knives Out franchise for $400 million. Director, writer Ryan Johnson is set to return for uh, to do two sequels. I, for one, um, I'm, well, I am excited that these exist because the first one was awesome. It was one of my favorite movies of 2019. I'm bummed that it's going to be a Netflix thing, though, because that was actually a fun movie to see in the theaters. Um, and... Uh, you know, I've had some conversations with people who say, oh, you know, it's not a big, you know, a big event movie. It's not Marvel. It's not Godzilla. You know, it's like, so, you know, I can watch it on Netflix. And my argument is you don't have to be a big movie to go enjoy it in the theater. Um, just imagine all the movies that have this brilliant cinematography or really good acting that really stands out on the big screen. Um, but the fact is we're getting two Knives Out movies and that's that's great. Um I talked about Transformers a second ago, and we're going to talk about it here again. Hamilton alum Anthony Ramos is in talks to lead a new Transformers movie. Will it pick up from where Bumblebee left off? I don't know. I don't know anything about it other than that. I'm hoping that it is at least going to continue the continuity of the film that, you know, fans and critics actually seem to like, um, as opposed to the Michael Bay, you know, and I'll... If you like those movies, good for you. Um, it's just not for me. <laughs> and finally, last bit of news, going back to DC, Warner Brothers has canceled James Wan's The Trench, which was a horror-centric spinoff of the uh, Aquaman film, which focuses on the monsters from The Trench, which was one of the coolest parts of that movie. Um, and they've also canceled Ava DuVernay's The New Gods movie, um, partially citing that uh, because... It has dark side in a different continuity than Zack Snyder's Justice League. But considering that the Warner Brothers DC movies currently have like no continuity at all anyways, I don't know why they would need to throw that out as an excuse. Um, they really kind of need to figure out their roadmap and uh, let us know like what's going on with their movies. So that's, that's the news for the week. Um, since uh, I don't remember, Daniel, if you were here when we started this this little segment, so we're going to talk about what we've been watching this week. Um, Daniel, did you watch anything uh, anything fun, cool this week? Anything new or just revisit an old classic? Nothing new. You know me. <laughs> uh, you ever watch Dragon Slayer from the 80s? I still haven't seen that. I watched that again. <laughs> that was it. That's got, what's it? It's Peter McNichol, right? Early hair dude? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think, I think it's Peter McNichol. The guy from, he's an Ally McBeal. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing new. <laughs> I, need, I need to catch that one day because, you know, that's, that's one of those 80s, weird 80s classics. Yeah, that's one of those ones I used to rent all the time when I saw it on. I was like, oh, let's watch something new or some B-movie crap I've seen before. Let's do that. <laughs> 
Well, hopefully next week you'll have watched something very new and very yeah, fun. Yeah, I tried. I gave it. <laughs> I fought with it for an hour, but couldn't get it to work. Yeah, it's technology for you. Yeah. Travis, have you watched anything uh, cool this week apart from the movie we're talking about next week? <laughs> um, nothing new. Mostly just revisits. Uh, me and my girlfriend finally caught up with the Infinity Saga. I showed her Spider-Man: Far From Home. So now we just need to get on to WandaVision. Um, did rewatch Men in Black, though, and just really grew my appreciation for Vincent D'Onofrio's performance as Edgar. It's pretty great. <laughs> yeah. As, what's funny is, like, with that film for me, is, like, as a kid, I always wonder, like, what's up with his weird body movements? But as an adult, you're just like, oh, it's because he's an eight, ten-foot-tall cockroach right. squeezing <laughs> into a human skin. Right. That'd be like me wearing a yeah. five-year-old sh- outfit. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, that first Men in Black is an absolutely mm-hmm. solid film. Um, it is. I need, to, sh- I need to catch that again. It's been a long time. It's a shame the sequels just can't live up to, like, the first one. Yeah. I enjoy the first three. Haven't seen the fourth one. I have only seen the first two. I've heard three was good, and mm-hmm. I've, I've heard four was kind of a miss, which is a shame because I... My first instinct was, oh, cool. Uh, Chris Hemsworth and Tessa Thompson are in another movie together. This should be great. And then it right. got terrible reviews, um, which, is, a, which is too bad. The third one's a mix for me, but I say it's definitely worth a watch just because of Josh Brolin's performance as a young Tommy Lee Jones. Oh. He does an amazing job playing that. Well, I'm going to ch- I'm gonna check and see if it's streaming on anything I've got because uh, <laughs> yeah, otherwise it may be worth a rent while <laughs> I'm still stuck inside for a while. <laughs> um i have not watched any like new movies recently um i actually i've i've been lying to everyone the last three weeks i've been watching of course the falcon and the winter soldier all okay. right so before we get into our main topic uh we're gonna have we're gonna do a little catch up with daniel because because uh man we missed you yeah i missed you um so first off first off um let's talk about King Kong versus Godzilla, because I'll tell you right now, Travis, Travis did the smart thing. You know, he had never seen it before that, before we started talking about it. He found the Japanese version on YouTube and started with that. So he oh. did not uh, watch the the American cut, which you and I lived with for yeah. so many years. Yeah. Um, so. Um, and you don't have the Japanese. Well, you don't have I have I have your your uh, unofficial release. <laughs> I I don't know. Have you tried watching it? I don't. I, I haven't tried. That, that I, I watched I watched the American one the other day though. That because that might be the DVD that doesn't work anymore. I don't know. Yeah, I think he told. I think he warned me. <laughs> but now I know it's on YouTube, so that's cool. I know, and not the uh, best picture quality. There were some parts I couldn't make out, especially right. on the Islander scene where I had a question right certain things yeah we just put the criterion version on on your li- on your christmas list and, yeah, and maybe yeah, yeah. It's, gonna <laughs> it's gonna happen um so let's let's talk about it really really quick that that hilarious american cut that we you know for the longest time we thought was the only thing that existed yeah yeah um whew. it's it's wacky <laughs> um kind of appreciated it more i watched it again with the kiddo and she loved it and i was like this is all crazy and ridiculous but it is pretty fun (laughs) the only thing that really i can deal with the whole crazy news guys and all that but the sound i wish the original music was in that's 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 yeah we talked about that that is uh the single biggest sin they committed when they brought it over yeah um and you know and i'm not you know again you wouldn't do that anymore these days film any of that extra footage um it's so funny though because right after we had the congress's godzilla episode i watched the snyder cut of justice league and i just feel so much empathy for uh all those fans out there who had been calling for the release of that now and thinking like oh my gosh like, because uh, it's so much better than the theatrical cut. And it's like, this is kind of what happened to right. the Japanese cut. 
like more so than any other Godzilla movie. Like it got butchered. Right. Um, so much stuff, just little things missing, but, uh, yeah, I mean, did you, did you see King Kong versus Godzilla before you saw creature from the black lagoon? Yeah. Yeah. So that wouldn't have been a surprise to you then the first no. time you saw it. Cause yeah, I remember for me, that was the biggest surprise. They're fighting the octopus. And all of a sudden there's that classic yeah. creature music. No, coming I, in. It's like, I didn't watch creature until I met you and I had seen Godzilla versus Kong before I met you. So yeah. Yeah. That's uh, it was, some, it was something, you know, hearing that music <laughs> the first time I'm like, what the heck is what's going on, dad? Right. <laughs> Why is this happening? Right. So yeah, that's that's what we lived with for so long before before the the much better real cut existed. And I I kind of want to uh, from here on out, I kind of just want to refer to the American cut as the Whedon cut, right? Uh, <laughs> because I think that's how uh, I think that's how modern audiences are going to understand the uh, right. the toil that we've gone through all these years. Yeah. Um. But uh, last week we talked about the MonsterVerse films, of course, leading up to. Uh, to Godzilla versus Kong. Um, which one, I just want to ask, which one is your favorite of the three that, that you've seen? Ooh. Ooh. I want to say Godzilla King of the Monsters, but I think it's probably Kong Skull Island. I really like that. Uh, yeah. But just by this much. <laughs> <laughs> We ranked them. Um, we individually ranked them last week. Uh, Travis, I believe, said Kong, then Godzilla. I did uh, Godzilla, King of the, or no King of the Monsters, Godzilla, Kong. Mm. And I went. Uh, I just went in order: Godzilla, Kong, oh, yeah. King of the Monsters. Um. Yeah. I, I, I actually would put, I'd also just group Godzilla and the first Godzilla and Kong really close together too. Um, yeah. I just, I don't know. I know, I know you're more of a fan of the campy stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, I just, so I'm so, I want, I want my grounded monster movies back. Right, right, um, right, right, right. I, you know, they, they don't have to be like the first film where it's super serious and everything, but uh, I just, and I, I, you know, I actually, I'm not going to say anything about Godzilla versus Kong. No, nothing, <laughs> nothing at all. <laughs> no one's going to know anything. Um, if you do want to know anything about Godzilla versus Kong, what I think about it, I actually did put up the uh, written review on the blog. So head over to uh, truthandfilm.wordpress.com to check out my uh, my very early thoughts about Godzilla versus Kong, and then we will talk about talk about it in all its glory next week. Uh, but now we now we've got some of that catch up out of the way uh, tonight. We're going to bonus round. We're going to talk about <laughs> the contenders to the throne. Um, and actually, because of the way that Godzilla's release date kind of went back and forth between like early April, early March, and then finally landed where it was, um, this originally like was supposed to be like perfectly scheduled. And we would have had the spoiler cast like after Godzilla came out. But this is just fun. This is fun. And I picked three... Uh, Hollywood films. I wanted to pick Hollywood films because we're kind of in the Hollywood era of Godzilla right now. Toho hasn't really done anything since uh, Shin Godzilla in 2016, and then their their trio of animated films on Netflix. Um, so we're kind of in this Hollywood era. So I want to talk about how these three particular Hollywood films had an influence on what we're watching now, um, and you know how they were influenced by what came before. Um, those three films are Cloverfield, Super 8. And Pacific Rim, and we might dive briefly into um, the sequels. Um, probably not so much Cloverfield because there's really not monster stuff going on in the other Cloverfield movies, but there is a sequel to Pacific, Pacific Rim that uh, is pretty much monsters and robots fighting each other. Just, but it's not as good. I'll just say that. <laughs> um, no. Oh, Cloverfield! What the heck, Cloverfield? Um, I love this movie. I want to talk really quickly about the marketing um, because back in 2007, this was like the biggest mystery of a movie. No one knew what it was about. 
J.J. Abrams is the producer. And so immediately we're all thinking, is this somehow linked to Lost? Because this was, of course, when Lost was at the height of its popularity. And J.J. Abrams is, of course, that kind of crazy, weird producer director. <laughs> and then we finally found out that it was a monster movie. And it was like, oh, cool. And then we found out it was a found footage movie. And found footage, of course, uh, sort of sprung out of the Blair Witch Project in 1999. It was kind of just a thing for horror movies for the longest time because it was like it was Blair Witch and Paranormal Activity were like the big ones. Um, and not a lot of other genres have really tackled the found footage uh, format. Um, and honestly, a, a giant monster movie is a perfect uh, way to do found footage, I think. Yeah. Agreed. Um, so, Daniel, you and I did not see this one together. I was not around here i was in oh yeah 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 Yeah. okay so yeah darn we can't we can't have any of those memories um travis did you see cloverfield in the theater i haven't seen it at all actually oh no oh man what what's the year on this i just no the original cloverfield Cloverfield, 2008 okay yeah so i was like 10 when that came out I'm trying to think I if I was at, if I worked at the theater then. I don't. I must have because I remember watching this like a million. That's one of those movies I watched like a million times just because I was at the theater all the day. <laughs> yeah, um, and you can talk. Feel about free it to. I, I don't want to ruin it for you, Travis. So feel free to like mute us if you have to, or do whatever you need to. <laughs> um, Wow, what a, what a, what an intense experience Cloverfield was. Um, a little, I think it kind, I think it kind of got a little rough for some people with the shaky shaky cam, but um, it worked out perfectly for me. Um, I don't think any other movie has captured that, you know, just on the ground experience of being right there during a monster attack um, that Cloverfield has. I think I think Godzilla twenty fourteen cuts it close with some of the camera tricks that it pulls. Mm -hmm. But uh, Cloverfield, I think, actually may still hold the the high mark for being the most intense uh, kaiju film um, released by an American studio. Um, Let me bring up the cast list here real quick. Got Lizzie Kaplan as Marlena, Jessica Lewis as Lily, TJ Miller as HUD, Michael Stahl David as Rob Hawkins, Mike Vogel as Jason Hawkins, and Odette Annabelle as Beth McIntyre. That's pretty much the main cast. And I'm honestly surprised that no one from this cast really, but really except for Lizzie Kaplan and TJ Miller, like broke out and did more after this. Um, Because Lizzie Kaplan has, of course, been in uh, what? It's the HBO show about vampires, True Blood. Yeah. (laughs) And, uh, and Masters of Sex, and then she was on. She was in the said, the interview with um. Why am I blanking on their names? James yeah, Franco um, and Seth Rogen. Oh, the so. I, I don't know why I, I was may mix that film up with uh, that one with Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson. You know the Wedding Crashers. They, what? No, they work for Google. Yeah. Oh, I know what one you're talking about now. Yeah, when you said interview, that's the first film that came to my mind. So I was like, Vince Vaughn, no one will see. Um, and then, of course, T.J. Miller um, on Silicon Valley for HBO in the two Deadpool movies. Um, but I'm honestly, like, given the uh, given the success that Cloverfield had when it released, I'm surprised that, uh, you know, none of these actors really went on to do uh, a lot of big things. But uh, I think I think it just kind of came down to the fact that uh, everyone was more really just impressed with the format more so than anything else. Right. Um, and kudos to uh, to both J.J. Abrams and Matt Reeves for taking the risk on this movie. Matt Reeves, of course, went on to direct uh, Let Me In, which was the remake of Let the Right One In, the Empire movie, and it's awesome. Yes, it is. Um, like, and yeah, again, this film is just visceral in your face. Um, you know, they're, one of the earliest moments in the film is, you know, they, they hear the, the oil tanker crashing 
out in the ocean and then they uh there's the explosion they go outside and literally like right in front of you on the camera the head of the statue of liberty just rolls right by um it's just so intense and like there's never that moment where anyone is feeling there's never breathing room in this movie yeah and not in the bad way where it's like they're just jumping from action scene to action scene it's because um unlike all the other movies we're about to talk about well i guess super eight kind of goes in the same kind of style but like these are real people um who are not like equipped to deal with a monster problem and even the military in this film is like they're not ready for it they have no idea what's going on um and i I feel like it also just sort of took the uh that tension we were all going through in in that decade of uh you know when's the next 9-11 yeah um Daniel, what, what do you think about Cloverfield? I just remember watching it so many times at the theater because I worked there and uh, the sound was awesome. It was just like, it was crazy. Um, I don't think I've ever watched it since then. So I wonder how, is it, I wonder if it's still the same. It probably is on like your TV or whatever, but yeah, I just remember the sound just like, it was so hectic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a cool concept. Uh, something you and me talk about all the time. <laughs> so, oh yeah, it was cool. It was cool to like have a movie about it. Yeah, no, uh, it, I really dig it. Like the little monsters that pop off. Yep. Them, that's cool. Uh, the the scene in the tunnel. Um, yeah, you know, as, as as scary as the uh, as the rest of the movie is, that scene in the tunnel was the worst. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, with the tiny little Cloverfield monsters. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's cool. You don't get to see the monster real too good till till the end, really, right? I'm trying to remember, um, you don't really ever get uh, a real good. Yeah, look the, at him. the best the best looks at it are when they're up in the helicopter, right? And they're looking down at it right before the big crash, right? And then um, right right when T.J. Miller dies, you know, he's looking right up at it, right? And it's right there. Um. But yeah, and yeah. it's just it's just such a it's just such a darn shame. It's like it's so sad because you know you're seeing it through the eyes of these people, and like only you know it's it's implied that one of them makes it out, right? Um, but it's not the people. It's nothing, you know. It's not the person who's got the camera, right? <laughs> the camera. Uh, everyone who touches that camera dies. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I hate to bring it up, but the T.J. Miller thing. It's kind of hard to. Yeah, he's uh, I, he's I made, do like him, but he's been in some he's, he's made some he's made some huge mistakes. Yeah, he's made some mistakes. So that's kind of a bummer when you watch it again. Uh, yeah. My uh, philosophy that, with that regard is always um, don't ever feel upset about how you felt when you first saw a movie. Right. And then you find out something like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something about someone in that movie. Um, yeah. No. And don't I also I also feel like. Um, for the sake of historical perspective, it's not a bad thing to look back at these movies. Right. No, um, sure. But I'm not going to rewatch this movie for T.J. Miller. I'm going to right, rewatch exactly. it for, for <laughs> right. Matt Reeves' brilliant direction and for a monster that is really cool looking. Right. Um, yeah. Once you finally see it. And a film that's incredibly tense. Right. Uh, um, and I remember the promotion stuff. You're right. That was really cool. They had like these websites where it was like, what was it like? some kind of junk food right i don't remember i just remember it was forget it was like some kind of mountain dew type of thing or something yeah anyway it was 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 just such a mystery yeah like what is cloverfield yeah it was cool and it turns out it was just you know the military designation for the video right right um but um and at the end of the at the end of the day it's also just a movie about uh, you know, two people who are going through kind of a bad breakup who are trying to find each other again. Right. And ultimately do end up in each other's arms whilst getting blown up by a <laughs> nuclear weapon. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, I just I just love how, uh, you know, they're, re- they're recording this stuff live over the uh, footage of those two mm-hmm. um, having their visit to Coney Island, you know, a month right. from a month ago. And you get to see little snippets of that 
And then at the end, the, you know, the best Easter egg in the film is, you know, one of the final shots is it's them looking out over the water and they accidentally catch on film uh, the creature crashing into the water a month before it starts attacking. Right. It's like, oh, that's so perfect. It's, it's really mm-hmm. cool. Like it was there the whole time. Right. Um, and then, you know, I like found footage type stuff, but, and this is early on enough where the whole thing where you're always filming, it's like, if you were in a real situation, just put the darn camera down. You know what I mean? <laughs> but yeah. this is early enough into, into that where it was okay. So, yeah, but I, but if you're like coming into this movie and you've seen a bunch of found footage stuff before, it probably, yeah. I, well, I actually lo- I love the moments where they like they tell him you know just put the camera down so we can you know cross this you know really haphazard building right you know just right dilapidated building and not die and he doesn't just stop the camera it's just hanging from you know his right. belt or whatever right. and it's right. just like right. awkwardly filming whatever he's stepping over right um cloverfield got a sequel it actually got two sequels Daniel, have like you seen either one. of them? You saw the second one? Second one's killer. Travis, you see either of the sequels? No. I'll talk about briefly the second one. Because again, mm-hmm. the, the second two movies aren't really monster movies. Like, they weren't even supposed to be Cloverfield movies. They just happened to be... The first <laughs> one happened to be a really good script that... I don't remember if it was J.J. Abrams gobbled it up and said, hey, turn yeah. this into a Cloverfield movie. But someone did. And it was brilliant because it's about a, a woman who is in a car accident on her way. Uh, I can't remember where she's going. It's Mary Elizabeth Winstead. She's, she's giving a leaving an abusive relationship, isn't she? Oh, yeah. Like she's going to meet her boyfriend or something. Right, abusive right, right. boyfriend. Yeah. That might be it. Um, she gets in a car crash and wakes up in a basement um, with uh, another guy. And they're like imprisoned by John Goodman, of all people. And he's telling them, you know, you have to stay here in this bunker with me. There's a monster on the loose outside. And the question's always like, is there really a monster on the loose? Is this just right. him being, you know, a creepy psycho? And he is a creepy so psycho in the movie, good. turns out. <laughs> um, he's really great at it. It's, yeah. it's such an anti-John Goodman role. Right. Um, you know, but it's not about the monster. But then by the end of the movie, she gets out. And it turns out that, uh, you know, the whole... Cloverfield timeline thing the first movie this is all have been happening at the same time right and you know she has to make the decision like I'm going to take a stand and I'm going to drive to you know where I'm needed right help out people right it's like, but it's so good and it's just a great it's twist that it does turn out to be in the so same scary story. he's so scary um so sometimes sometimes the kaiju is just John Goodman because yeah. <laughs> he's big and scary yeah. um I'm not going to talk about the third movie because it is awful and yeah. I don't know why they, <laughs> it, it just, it's just bad. Um, let's, let's talk about super eight. Super eight is the next film on, on this list. I know Daniel seen super eight. We saw it together. Travis, have you seen super eight? I saw it when it uh, came out, not in theaters, but when it came out on home release. So I did see it. I just don't remember much of it. There's just little bits and pieces here I can remember of it right now. Well, the good news is Super 8 shares a lot in common with movies like E.T., The Goonies, and Stranger Things. So, you know, if you know if you know any of those movies, you're in good company already. Right. Um, in fact, I would go so far to say Super 8 is less of a of a kaiju movie and definitely more of I a totally Spielberg. forgot about it really <laughs> like i i love that movie and i when you said it i was like oh right right <laughs> i just love the kids stuff so much in that one yeah um oh i mean like it it's a lot like it yeah mm-hmm. um but it's really it's less of a kaiju movie um because you know but i'm including it because i really do think that it had sort of a an effect on what we got out of the Godzilla movies right. and Kong um, because we got uh, Millie Bobby Brown mm-hmm. in King of the Monsters and in Godzilla versus Kong and Millie Bobby Brown, of course, came over there from Stranger Things, which I don't know if we would have had Stranger Things if we didn't have Super 8 first. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think uh, I think Cloverfield was a success because of how well it was marketed um, and just the team behind it, you know, 
the brilliance of like telling us, you know, you want to see this movie and we're not going to tell you why. Right. Um, Super 8 was successful because it's that nostalgia bait. It was, it's very good nostalgia bait, Mm -hmm. um, but it is nostalgia bait. You know, we, you know, we go into it and, you know, we say, oh, look, it's Stephen King's it. It's E.T. Like all those things I just said, except Stranger Things. But like. Right. Um, so I, you know, it's such an enjoyable little film and it's not. And this one isn't just even a kaiju film. It's also got lots of references to old school universal monsters, to makeup artists. Um, it's just and they, they're, you know, they're basically the whole plot is they're trying to film these kids are trying to film their own little zombie movie and just happen to be there when a train um, is derailed and a monster escapes from it. Right. Um, so, you know, <laughs> these kids are right up our alley. Um, right. Yeah. Doing exactly what we like, what we thought we, you know, <laughs> we thought we should be doing. <laughs> right. And we yep. probably would have been doing if we had an actual camera. To work yeah. With. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to bring this one up because it has Kyle Chandler in it who is playing the father figure and of course would go on to play the father figure in King of the Monsters and in Godzilla versus Kong. Um, and I was so excited um, to hear that he was going to be in King of the Monsters um, because of this movie. And the, just the darndest shame is he's so much better in this. Yeah. Um, but that just has everything to do with the fact that the script for this movie is it's just better. Um, the characters all around are better. J.J. Um, Abrams, um, honestly, like I'd say that this is probably my second favorite J.J. Abrams film after the first Star Trek. Mm. Um, but this is like, this is probably I think his last like great film um, before before he kind of went off the rails with <laughs> with Star Trek and Star Wars. <laughs> um, Agreed. Um, and it's just so, and it's great that he had Steven Spielberg on board to produce. It's actually interesting that, you know, Abrams is involved in two films we're talking about tonight, Mm -hmm. first as a producer and then as a director. Um, as, as far as story goes, I think it's JJ Abrams best story because this is a, this is an Abrams script. Um, and Star Trek's great, but it's great because it's Star Trek. Um, but again, the kids in this cast, you know, this is where we got, this is where I think most of us, most of the world was introduced to Elle Fanning um, back when we didn't know that Dakota Fanning had a little sister who was a better actor. <laughs> no offense to Dakota Fanning, but Elle Fanning is much cooler. Um, for one thing, she made this movie. Um, but I, yeah, I love, I love that this movie kind of goes back to uh, what that old school horror and sci-fi uh, sensibility yeah. of if the story is more important um, when you know what's going, how it's affecting the people around what's happening. Um, and it's uh, one of those wonderful stories where the military is actually, uh, you know, portrayed as the evil villain, which is something you don't usually see in these kind of films. Yeah. Um, but again, that was also just sort of a, a trend of those uh, late seventies, early eighties, you know, kid versus monster movies is the, uh, the the military usually ends up being the actual monster right daniel what do you remember about super eight i mean not the important stuff i i love their bedrooms man i love the sets because they're all their the bedrooms are full of monster movie posters and monster models and stuff uh it, yeah that that's great uh, that's what I mostly think of, but I also I do like the whole the kids growing up kind of thing. You know what I mean? Because the girl gets introduced, and then the two main homies. You know, all of a sudden there's a girl in the middle, and the one guy's like, "Hey, man, you're not hanging out like you used to," you know? And it's I like that. That's great. It's really good for kids in a movie. These are ones are this is a good kid movie. I, yeah, um, I, don't I, was, even, I don't even think about the monster. I totally space on it. I know. Like, like I said, this movie is really more about the town than it is yeah. the monster. And it's such a very well-realized town. Yeah. Um, 
and I love the attention to detail. Like I love the first shot in the movie is actually um, in the factory where um, Ron Eldred's character, Louis Daynard works and where our Joe Lamb, the main kid, his character, where his mom has died. Um, and the first shot of the movie is someone changing the sign of, you know, one day, you know, how many days since the last accident right. down to one day since the last accident. It's like, Oh, that is a, yeah. You know, something's up. <laughs> something's right wrong. Get, and then, yeah. you know, and it's just a, and it's a great, it is a great, it's a great coming of age movie too, with Joe and his, and his father with Kyle Chandler of learning, you know, how to be a dad in the absence of the other parent. Um, and then at the end of the movie, um, that beautiful moment where uh, the monster is creating its ship in the, uh, was it the wa the water um, the water tower? Yeah, and it's pulling in all the metal objects to create its ship, and it pulls in the little locket, um, Joe's locket with his, the picture of his mother, and that's the moment where he decides um, it's time to let go. Yeah, um, it's just it's just it's really a really good coming of age movie, but like you said, it's not as much about the monster. Yeah, um, but it does have some great moments, like the gas station is a really yeah freaky moment where the sheriff is uh is kidnapped and uh and the monster itself actually is pretty frightening um it's yeah. a pretty ugly monster yeah yeah I, I really like it man and it's one that i watch with the wife and you know she's not into the stuff we're into so she likes it too so <laughs> travis did uh, did any of this jog your memory about super eight um Somewhat, yeah. Like, like I said, I saw it when I was like little kid, and it was like once. So it's not something that even been in my memory, honestly, until now. I completely forgot the film existed. Like when you brought this up, I'm like flashbacks right here. Um, I definitely remember the kid actors definitely being really good, and I do remember the train scene where that man drove his car to stop the train. Like the stuff with him and the monster, that stuff stuff in my head, and of course that shot you talked about where like the locket being taken by the monster's magnetic ship thing. That always stuck in my mind too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really like this one. It's just a fun movie and uh, it's all, it turns 10 this year. Wow. Which is nuts. Cause uh, like I said, I distinctly remember when you and I saw it in the theater. Right. It's like, Oh my God, that's been, that was 10 years ago. Yeah. It's so good. I'm probably going to watch it tonight when we're done. <laughs> well unfortunately super eight and i and i get it not all these monster movies are going to get a sequel super eight didn't get a sequel it mm -hmm. does wrap up very well though so yeah. it didn't necessarily set itself up that way mm -hmm. our next film however was so big that you couldn't not do a sequel and that of course is pacific rim released less than a year before the uh, first MonsterVerse Godzilla. Mm -hmm. This was sort of, to me, the movie that was like, at the time when we saw it in the theater was like, is this going to be the movie that sets the bar? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say if it did when we're done talking about it, but uh there was a lot of anticipation going into this one because uh, there was a very specific director attached to it that, you know, we all love. And that's, of course, Guillermo del Toro. And uh, we've talked about on this show and at Halloween time, we talked about uh, Crimson Peak and The Shape of Water. And now we get to talk about my favorite Guillermo del Toro movie. And I, I still love those other two. But uh, like just knowing at the time how he felt about Godzilla movies was really exciting just knowing that he specifically was working on this so you know when when we saw it in the theater um i can say we definitely walked away impressed <laughs> yeah yeah travis how what did you think about pacific rim pacific rim i remember when it came out um didn't see it in theaters but it was on rewatch all the time at home on like home media such a very entertaining movie like I actually just recently got it on 4k at Walmart the other day because like it's 
still haven't rewatched it yet just because like other stuff but it's definitely a very entertaining film and like you said it's like Guillermo del Toro I love him um but my my favorite of his film definitely is a childhood favorite of mine Hellboy because like Hellboy's great <laughs> what I love about Guillermo del Toro and his films is like you could tell he's a fanboy so when he makes yeah. these films yeah. you could definitely tell like there's love and passion behind it with a lot of movies nowadays you could tell they're just directors like coming in they're hired to do a task but like yeah. Guillermo with this and Hellboy and all the others you could tell these are films he wanted to make and that's what I love about it yep so many details so many little things he put in there just to make it all the much better uh the world building in this film is my favorite of the three movies that we've talked about so far yeah um and it definitely helps that this one actually sort of takes place in, a, in an alternate reality, an alternate future where we've been living with monsters for years, as opposed to Cloverfield, mm -hmm. where it's grounded in a you know real 2000 date, mm -hmm. where Cloverfield is grounded in the past. Um, I just watched Pacific Rim again the other night, and it starts um, it's, it starts in 2013. He's you know Raleigh's talking about when he was a kid. You know, I'd look up at the stars and that takes place in 2013. And then we flash forward and it takes place in 2020. And then we flash forward again and it takes place in 20, like the most of the film takes place in 2025. It's like, oh man, we, we just missed the apocalypse. <laughs> um, we were so glad. <laughs> well, we, we got a different apocalypse. It, but <laughs> we got but a different it's not one. giant monsters. <laughs> yeah. We got the less cool one. <laughs> we got small monsters. Yeah. Yep. Um, and what, like, what a what a wild cast he rounded up for this movie. Like, Charlie Hunnam as Raleigh Beckett, Rinko Kikuchi as Mako Mori, who is probably my favorite character in the whole movie. Charlie Day, Charlie Day, Charlie as Doctor Newton Geisler. <laughs> um, and perfectly cast opposite him. Vern Gorman as Gottlieb and like I uh, got uh, Max Martini as Herc Hansen who is just great role for him Clifton Collins Jr. is I love him he's just having such a good time as Tendo um, and you got Ron Perlman making his standard Guillermo del Toro appearance not a big one but certainly memorable as Hannibal Chow <laughs> but of course you killer. know but of course, have to mention last because he may just be the coolest character in the whole movie, frickin' Idris Elba mm -hmm. as Stacker Pentecost. Um, the movie that proved that uh, that proved that Marvel wasn't using him properly for the longest time. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, what an awesome cast! Yeah, I definitely agree with you. Like when it came to Idris Elba, like. Thor was the first movie I think I saw with Idris Elba in it. But this was like the first one where I was just like, oh my God, this guy is so badass and amazing. He was good in Thor, but here, like, just so memorable, so great. And not to mention his big monologue at the end, which has yeah. become easily one of the greatest monologues in history, right up there with like Braveheart and right. then Day. Yep. And like you said, like so many other greats, like when I saw Charlie Day before this, I loved watching It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. I still love that show. So seeing him pop up was pretty fun. And then seeing Guillermo del Toro appear in It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia later, also pretty fun. And Ron Perlman, like I said, grew up with Hellboy. So seeing him is always a blast. One of my favorite actors of all time. Wish he got more um, attention. And like this is just one of those one of those scripts where mm -hmm. they were able to balance that sort of comedy and fun and looseness with the the horror of what was going on because uh like you know I think they tried to pull the same thing off in um in Godzilla King of the Monsters with um why am I blanking on people's names tonight <laughs> but it's the actor uh Bradley Whitford Mm -hmm. um from the west wing i think they tried to make him like the charlie day of that movie right. it's like oh it just doesn't work it doesn't work um 
they they couldn't they couldn't figure out the comedy in King of the Monsters. Mm-hmm. Um, they couldn't figure out figure out the the looseness and the fun of that film, and balance it out with the spectacle. Here, it's just perfect. Um, there's those wonderful moments like, uh, wait, I think it's dead, but let's check for a pulse. Right. <laughs> and just turn around and blast it right. wide open. It's like, okay, no pulse. It's like, oh yeah. Um, and like I was mentioning the world building earlier, just I love I love the uh, the mm-hmm. Shatter Dome facility that they spend most of the movie in. It just looks like this lived in, you know, enclave. It looks like it actually looks like something out of the, of a Fallout game. Um, just a a, li- a very lived in world. Um, and this their depiction of Hong Kong. Uh, one of my favorite moments is when Hannibal Chow is pointing out like the the sort of religious fanatics who like worship the kaiju and they I was like, gonna was gonna bring that up. I, I actually read the novelization just because I found it at like thrift store and it goes into more of that and I that's like one of my favorite little bits. <laughs> it's too bad it's just mentioned. But yeah that's that's a cool oh, yeah. that's a cool uh concept right out of Lovecraft. Yeah these people worshiping these other beings yeah it's great <laughs> and not to mention the fact that you know what what hannibal chow does for a living is right. you know salvages the remains of dead kaiju and sells sell them on yeah. the black market because as it turns out giant dead monsters have several you know uses around the home <laughs> yeah that's, like, a, that's I a cool love, bit so yeah. it's it really it really takes the concept like a lot it just takes the the sort of like it really is i'm having a really hard time putting together this thought it really is the movie that told the story of what happens after the monster attacks Mm -hmm. but then it also just keeps attacking anyways right like you you know that's the thing about a god's the godzilla movies is with the exception really of the original film where you do get to see the aftermath of godzilla's Mm -hmm. rampage i mean you know it happens occasionally again like in godzilla raids again you get a little bit of it but like you never get to see, you know, what happens in between the movies. It's like, you know, how do we rebuild? Um, and, you know, how do we prepare for the next thing? Um, and this this time around, you do. You do get to see. You've seen what they've done. And you get to see what they're trying to do and how the government is trying to, you know, shut down the Jaeger program and instead, like, we're going to build a wall. <laughs> hey, look at that. The government's trying to build a wall. <laughs> and it don't <laughs> work. <laughs> and it doesn't work. Um, and like, and you get the sense that there's, you know, you also get the sense of the class system in that movie. Like everyone who's building the wall is like the working class people. And I think, I think it might've been in the sequel. They talk about how like all the rich people like live inland. Right. And it's like all the, all the, uh, lower class people live on the coastal cities because those are the cities that are getting hit. Right. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, like, and just the the character building in this in this movie is also brilliant. We've already talked about Idris Elba, um, Rinko Kikuchi in this film as Mako. My still my favorite character. The best scene in any movie, in any American movie that we have discussed to this point, in my opinion, is when she chases the rabbit, and we get to see her as you know. Mm-hmm. a little a little kid right um you know just experiencing the death of her parents and just wandering around the rubble of uh you know presumably somewhere in japan and just great. the night it, it, it's the nightmare that uh you know yeah. mm-hmm. that daniel you and i probably have had occasionally where it's like <laughs> it is it, it and it's almost it almost captures that cloverfieldness yeah that cloverfield of being on the ground right there mm-hmm. um, with, and w- with what in Pacific Rim is an even bigger monster than in Cloverfield. Um, it's just, and, and, it, and it's not just the monster stuff too. There's the scene where uh, Raleigh is trying to find his co-pilot and he and Mako have their little sparring session and he chooses her. And it's just a, that's a great little fun action scene. Right. And just the whole lore of this world of how they create the Jaegers and it's linked up with the pilots and they're sharing 
their brain power to operate these machines. Um, and we have yet to have uh, like this type of, of robot in a Godzilla movie, which is a shame. <laughs> Yeah, we've had we've had Mecha Godzilla, we've had Mecha King Ghidorah. Um, that's really it, right? Mecha Kong. <laughs> well, he's never shown up in a Godzilla no. movie. Well, there was a Jet Jagger. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, uh. Still though, still not even quite the same. <laughs> no. <laughs> Mogera, he shows up. Oh, that's about. Yep, that's about as close as you get. And I guess nine, the ninety-three Mecha Godzilla kind of cuts it close. Yeah, since he's actually piloted from within. Yeah, but like, there's something about there's something about the Jaegers and Pacific Rim that's like that's never that's something that you know you don't see on film. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you have a favorite? A favorite Jaeger? Um, I can't remember. All their names. Yeah, oh, yeah. I don't remember the name. Um, the only one I remember is Gypsy Danger, the main right. one. That's, but he's the main one. So yeah, I you know Gypsy Danger I, is I think the easy pick. I'm probably gonna go with Gypsy Danger, but I also like the uh, the three armed one is really cool. Oh, can you guess mine? I bet you can. Come on, Ben. Think about it. What's the dumbest one? <laughs> is it the Russian one? The Russian one is so cool. <laughs> He's so dumb. I mean, I like that he has the fist pack when he's about to punch. He puts the thing in his. Bam, it's great, dude. I mean, they're all kind of dumb if you think about it. Even the three arm one doesn't make sense because, like, there's three of them. So why is there only like three arms or something? Right. No, like, I, I love the Russian one though. <laughs> it's so silly. Um, and I, I love um, and again. This film can focus on its human characters because no one kaiju in this film is really the star. Right. There's a bunch of them and they're all cool. Yeah. Um, from the get go, from the opening scene where you see one destroying the Golden Gate Bridge, it's like even for a split second, you get to see these really cool monsters. Um, obviously, the highlight um, battle, um, I don't even think the climax is the highlight battle. I think the battle in Hong Kong is cooler. Yeah. Um, where they have to bring in Gypsy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's like it's what it's Silverback, the gorilla monster, which yeah, is like yeah. there. He clearly wanted King Kong. Yeah. He clearly wanted a King Kong in this movie, and I can't remember the name of the other one, but it's the one that the spit monster, the spitting, right. the like lizard. And it, it turns into a bat. Yeah, <laughs> so cool, so cool. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of cool moments in here, but um, I was I gonna say I was gonna talk about something. I can't remember what I was about to say. Oh, I now I'm thinking it's like probably the coolest moment for me was just like just seeing Gypsy Danger just drag the ship or whatever cool. and then beats the monster with it. It's just yeah. I, I like it in monster movies and stuff or any movies where they use the environment to the advantage yeah. and it's not just like same thing, just different location. Yeah, I really enjoy that. Um, yeah, that whole fight is just incredible. Um, the part where I think I think it's again the spitter monster just crashes through a building, yeah. um, or just and again I don't know I don't know how it works in this film and it hasn't worked as well in like King of the Monsters, but like the moment where Gypsy punches into that one office building and then just hits yeah. the uh, what the uh, the Newton the yeah. Newton ball machine. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. that's just so cute. Um, it was. I don't know, he, the... But it was entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> it's wildly entertaining. And again, just a, a, just a plethora of yeah. wonderful, unique characters. And um, I think a lot of this does stem from the director, Guillermo del Toro, because like looking at his films, you could tell he has a style. He knows how to balance the action with the comedy. Again, like I bring up Hellboy or Blade 2. It's just like... He knows how to do it because, like, when you see other directors try to do it, they don't know how to. Because, like, even with the sequel, I haven't seen the sequel, but like, I could just tell from the trailers, I'm getting very independent, say, resurgence vibe from this. Yeah. Is like, I did not see Independent State Resurgence, but let's talk about Daniel. Did you see Pacific Rim Uprising? I did. I did. It's not as good. Oh, it's yeah. just it just plain isn't. And, uh, 
you know, a huge part of that is, of course, Guillermo del Toro wasn't involved. Um, mm -hmm. It had there were it had also a good a ba good base cast, mostly just a base cast in John Boyega, who, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll, I'll give I'll give it this. They give John Boyega more to do in Pacific Rim Uprising than he had in Star Wars episodes eight and nine. Right. Um, but his supporting cast just uh, didn't quite uh, land the way that the supporting cast in the first one did. First off, the only other, the only returning characters, and I'm going to get into spoiler territory here, but this is a three-year-old movie and we've been spoiling everything else tonight. So <laughs> buzz off. Um, the only returning characters are uh, Guy Geisler and Gottlieb, the two scientists, and Mako, who is unceremoniously killed off about 20 minutes into the movie yeah. when she should have been the star. Yeah. Um, it should have been her movie. And I get why I think they mentioned that they killed Raleigh off screen, like between movies. And that's just because I don't, I think Charlie Hunnam was like busy um, doing a, what was the FX show he was on about the bikers? Sons of Anarchy. Sons, I think he was busy doing Sons of Anarchy at the time for, for whatever reason he couldn't come back. Right. So I think I think they wanted him back, but they just couldn't get him. Um, but like he's got Scott Eastwood in there and it's like, mm, OK. <laughs> and <clears throat> pardon me. I will admit um, I, I did like the twist of the sequel where they make you think that the villain is. Um, I can't remember the name of the character, but she's in charge of the big corporation of course of course in these type of movies it's always the person who runs the big corporation who's the villain and i think she's like researching either like kaiju drifting or something with mixing kaiju and jaeger she's doing something weird and you think oh she's going to be the villain and then it turns out it's actually uh geisler who's the villain mm -hmm. and who's letting the kaiju in from the other dimension um because drifting with the kaiju in the first film drove him crazy um so that I actually thought that was a good twist. Yeah. But other than that, um, yeah, I just think they committed the ultimate sin in killing off Mako so quickly. And then from then on out, it's just like, oh man, John Boyega, you're the only thing that's holding this one together, buddy. <laughs> well, and it's just, um, it's the thing of a sequel. Like if you don't have somebody who really cares about what they're doing, you know yeah. I mean? Without Del Toro there, it's just, it's not the same. And you know, um, they got uh, they got Stephen Denight, who was the showrunner for season one of Daredevil, which had given me hope because season one of Daredevil was mm -hmm. chef's kiss. Just <laughs> some of the best Marvel stuff that's uh, ever happened. Um, but that doesn't always translate. You know, the, you know, being good at uh, running at running a Netflix Marvel show doesn't always translate to uh, directing a massive giant monster picture. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't think he was originally um, supposed to be the director anyways. I don't know if Del Toro was originally set to direct this one. Um, the good news is, if he was, I think he would have dropped out to do Shape of Water. Right. Which is, you know, because that came out like just months before this one. Yeah. Um, and all hail that movie. Um, <laughs> but, oh man, yeah, Pacific Rim. Um, so... I'm just going to say it. You know, I, I asked earlier, is this the one that set the bar? I think it is. I think this film set the bar for what we should have expected from kaiju movies going forward. And as much as I appreciate what uh, the MonsterVerse has done, I don't think they've hit that bar yet. No. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, you know, this is me coming off of um, saying... I appreciate my Godzilla movies grounded like that first one, and Pacific Rim is not grounded. Right. Um, I, I think it. I think it's grounded in the right way. I think it's grounded yeah. in the world that it built. And I think the problem with the Godzilla movies is they're not grounded in the world they build. They keep changing it. Right. Yeah. No. Um, I, I totally agree with you on that because, like, I think one of the biggest strengths for Pacific Rim for me was like how real the action scenes felt like like Guillermo del Toro did a really good job making you feel like these are actual giant monsters and robots fighting each other and he kept it consistent which I think is another problem that threw me off when I saw the trailers for the sequels like I felt like I was watching like pop or the just a 
trailer for the new Transformers or something. Right. Where it was like so over the top and cartoon. Now I love over the top and cartoony, but like um, considering the first one was very well done with its action sequences by, like I said, a fanboy who's putting in the effort to really make them everything work. Right. And then in a sequel, it's just like it's obvious studio interference. Like, get a sequel out. We want to make the money. Get, do this, do that, and all that. They even changed the title. Mm-hmm. Um, for the longest time, it was supposed to be Pacific Rim Maelstrom, which is actually a cool title. Right. Um, and then it turned into Uprising, which I don't know why. There's no Uprising. <laughs> There's really not a Maelstrom either, but you know, <laughs> but it there was. Cool. <laughs> um, and I guess it should be noted, um, I don't know if it's out yet, but there is a Pacific Rim anime um, on Netflix. Mm-hmm. It's either out now or it's coming very soon. And it's already been picked up for a second season. So um, it could be that uh, that's the way that we get a great follow-up to the, the first movie. Mm-hmm. Um, so of these three movies, um, what would you say... Of these three movies, I think we, we're probably all in agreement here that Pacific Rim is our favorite. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I called this episode the contenders to the throne. Even though I think Pacific Rim has set the uh, the high bar for films itself, um, I still don't, I still would not consider it the contender to the, I don't think anyone here wins the throne. No. And Pacific Rim only doesn't win the throne because it's a lot of monsters versus Godzilla's single monster and, you know, King of the Monsters, a bunch of well-known monsters, and of course Kong. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no there's no one standout monster in Pacific Rim. Um, they're just all really cool. Right. Um, <laughs> what I would... Mm, no, I'll talk about that in the next episode. Um, what, Travis, what do you think... Um, of the movies you've seen in this and what you remember, how do you think that these movies um, had an effect on the MonsterVerse films? Um, I definitely feel like they each had their own contributing factors. Um, Like from what I've heard about like um, Cloverfield, I feel like that really brought back the love for giant monster movies because I don't think they were as popular at that time. And I think that I could be wrong, though, because I was a little kid at this time, so I wasn't really following movie news and all that. And I think Super 8 also, like you said, it if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't have Stranger Things. And there are definitely many films, including the MonsterVerse, which try to incorporate more kid actors and kid characters into their things, including Millie Bobby Brown, who's in the MonsterVerse. And also... Um, uh, what's that kid's name? I don't know the actor's name. He was in Deadpool 2 and now he's in... Oh, Julian Dennison. Yeah. And it even happened with Pacific Rim because, again, like in the sequel, like they incorporate more kid act characters and that one actually didn't look too good. I like kid characters, but only if it's done right because right. otherwise they're just annoying right. side characters and all that. And I think Pacific Rim the way it helped shaped it is of course even though they were made so close i don't think pacific Rim could have really done much uh considering how close they were to release i do think pacific Rim helped set the standard for like the monster fights and i do think they did help influence sequels and stuff like that with how they do that daniel what do you think um about what exactly are we (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, I same, pretty much agree. Same question. Oh, you pretty much, okay. Yeah, pretty much agree. Uh, well, first off, I'm going gonna, gonna to cut in. Travis, you're absolutely right. Before Cloverfield, um, there really that there really wasn't an interest in kaiju films here mm-hmm. in, in America. Um, other countries were still, particularly, you know, East Asian countries were still making them, you know, Toho was still making Godzilla movies up through 2004. Mm-hmm. Um, and they sort of, I, they, you know, when Godzilla Final Wars come out, came out, it wasn't, it wasn't an ending so that an American studio could make a Godzilla movie this time, the way it was in 95. That was 
10 year gap between that and uh, the first monster vs. Godzilla. Mm-hmm. Um, but we also got um, South Korean film, um, the host, the host um, from Bong Joon Ho, mm-hmm. Bong Joon Ho, um, in 2006. Another one to bring up that I think was a really good one. We talked about found footage and kaiju. I think another good one that people should check out: Troll Hunter. Oh, um, you guys saw that? Troll Hunter, so good. <laughs> it Isn't is. that? <laughs> Daniel, which which country is that? Is that Norway? It's Swedish, I think. Hang on, I think I can let me because it's definitely one of the Scandinavian countries. Yeah, yeah, but again, like it's not what it just hasn't been. Um, Norwegian, a Hollywood, yeah. Norwegian, thing. yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, hasn't been a Hollywood. It hasn't been a thing for Hollywood to do until now, mm-hmm. um, and even then, um, like. Cloverfield was successful again because of the way it was hyped. Um, you know, it had a, I don't know its budget, but I know it was able to probably keep its budget lower by, you know, by casting a bunch of relative unknowns and hiding the monster as well as they did for most of the movie. Mm-hmm. Super 8 was successful again because they did the nostalgia baiting and it's, you know, great J.J. Abrams stuff going on there. Um, but Pacific Rim kind of, it kind of tanked here in the States. Yeah. Um for its entire theatrical run, it only made $100 million, which is, uh, you know, what kind of what you would have wanted it to do its opening weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, thank goodness the Chinese market basically saved that film, and it's the only reason that we got a sequel. Um, Godzilla, thankfully, managed the $100 million its opening weekend, but, uh, you know, that series has also seen diminishing returns. <laughs> Uh, Kong Skull Island didn't quite hit the 100 mil, but I think it was still considered successful enough. Mm-hmm. But King of the Monsters was a, it had a rough opening weekend. And again, a huge part of that can be attributed to um, the sheer idiocy of opening a mere few weeks after the biggest Marvel movie of all time. Right. Um, and currently, I'll, the only thing I'll say about Kong, Godzilla versus Kong right now is it is it is being considered a financial success, mm-hmm. but we also have to consider that, uh, you know, we've got the, the pandemic factor in there yeah. of this has been one of the biggest opening weekends for a movie in a while, but. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I think it's still possible because I think Wonder Woman had a similar situation because, and it announced a sequel not that long after, but like you said, it's just like Godzilla King of the Monsters, I think make like half of both, King Kong or Go- Godzilla and Kong Skull Island. So a lot of people are actually up in the air about whether or not they're going to continue the franchise after this. I have a bit more to say on that, but I'll talk about that. Yeah. Spoiler that talk. is a next week thing. Because <laughs> I was just about to say something that could have been considered a spoiler, but I was like, nope, <laughs> take that back. Don't, don't say that. So, yeah, and then, and, uh, you know, I was going to say, uh, I think I think what Cloverfield did to influence these films, I think it really only influenced the first one. First off, by again generating interest in the kaiju film, but it is that on the you know on the ground right there feeling that right. it gave to the first Godzilla film that the other films kind of took away. Um, I I feel like I feel like uh, Super Eight and Pacific Rim maybe had a little bit more influence on Kong with that sense of nostalgia as well as uh, creating you know Travis and I talk about how Kong doesn't necessarily have the world's greatest cast but the ones that work are are great are really fun um Tom Hiddleston Brie Larson um hey John Goodman again um and a handful of others um who are just really fun to watch in that movie um and I think Pacific Rim helped out with that a lot um and Pacific Rim still just has the best best freaking cast yeah. out of any of these movies like hands down mm-hmm. um best best cast best director um these are just these are three great films that really set the bar in their own ways um for for kaiju films and i think um i i hope that we get more like mm-hmm. um specifically more like pacific rim where <laughs> you get that director who no absolutely knows and will fight for um what 
mm -hmm. they want in the film. That's definitely something I do respect about E.L. Moore because I actually remember a story that he went to so many studios to try to get Hellboy greenlit, but they kept trying to make stipulations and rules on it, and he kept not budging on his stance on how he wanted to make it, which I yeah. respect. Because I think there were a few like, oh, Hellboy's going to be a human who turns into Hellboy, stuff right. like that. Or and the biggest is that they didn't want Ron Perlman as the main character. Yeah. They wanted a bankable actor. Which he, is what... He hasn't, um, he, he hasn't got to make his Mountains of Madness movie because they wanted it to be PG-13 and he said, nah. I think he was also... Hard, it's not going to be done. I think he was also attached to do the Universal Monster Universe. I was supposed to start with The Mummy. Yeah. But creative. He was going to do, uh, he was supposed to do one of them. Yeah. I think he was initially brought on to be like the Kevin Feige of that, but him and the studio couldn't agree creatively on how it's done. So he left. They made The Mummy with Tom Cruise, failed. <laughs> and then he made basically his own creature from the Black Lagoon right. yep. and won an Oscar. Yep. yep. And, uh, and Universal, I think, decided to go the, a much better route with their movies too. I think The Invisible Man was a great, a great starting point for uh, setting a standard for what they should do with those movies. Mm -hmm. But that's off topic. Um, <laughs> I was going to say something about oh, um, I was actually I read the other day on IMDb about how, and then you know, this is just how much Guillermo del Toro appreciates these old movies. Is he he designed the kaiju? Um, you know, he said. We know they're going to be CG at the end of the day, but they were designed as though they were supposed to be rubber suits. Yep. Ooh. Which is, you know, <laughs> just shows you how much he's dedicated to that craft. And right. mm -hmm. just, you know, and I think, it, I think it definitely shows with the silverback monster for sure. You know, he, he, loves, he loves King Kong. Right. <laughs> It's a, it's a shame that he couldn't get, you know, and I, I get it. He couldn't get a monster that looked quite like Godzilla in that movie. Right. Because, mm -hmm. uh, and we'll probably talk about this a little bit next week, but it has come up so much, you know, in the past couple of years. Like, the ultimate dream has, has just been the Godzilla Pacific Rim crossover movie. <laughs> like, that's just what everyone wants, you know. Um, and I, I won't say anything more because that's 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 kind of a next week thing. <laughs> um, Travis, do you have any final thoughts on this before we move on to trivia? Final thoughts. Um, like I said, like I didn't see Cloverfield. I barely remember Super Eight Pacific Rim. I know the most, but. The just from what I hear and what I have seen, they are definitely really good films that I feel like should get a bit more attention. Like kaiju films are definitely a nice genre. I think like from what I hear, these films all do really good jobs. And I can definitely attest for Pacific Rim. Um, it's like I said, like when you watch those films by fanboys, you could definitely tell the quality difference. It's kind of like when you watch Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, you can tell he was a fan of that and you enjoy those films. Um, and I do wish more were made in that same style. I do wish Gail Moore could come back and do more of these giant monster movies. But at the same time, it's just like, it's hard to... Hollywood has their decisions and they do what they do. But these are definitely films I say check out. I will, I, as, as much as I would love Guillermo del Toro to come back and do another giant monster movie, I will never impose upon him what to do because he will always come back with something that is just absolutely amazing anyways. Oh. Like the second he left The Hobbit, it was like, oh man, he left The Hobbit, but then he made Pacific Rim. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, he's not going to be, you know, directing Pacific Rim 2. Oh, we got The Shape of Water instead. Cool. Right. It's like... <laughs> It always seems to work out with him. I don't know. He's never he's never had a dud for me. Nope. So, Daniel, what are your your final thoughts on this? Um, these are all three real good movies, and uh, made by people who care. And I think that's the bit that's missing sometimes. Um, 
we didn't talk about monsters from Gareth Edwards. Uh, another, oh, yeah. I mean, he directed Godzilla, <laughs> and that's a great one. Um, it just, yeah, it, they just work better if the people care, you know. And all these movies, obviously, they like monster movies, so yeah. Oh yeah, I'll talk about it really quick because it's been a long time since I've seen monsters, but uh, that's how you know Gareth Edwards got the Godzilla job. You're right, is, and if you're looking, if if you're that type of person who like was super disappointed in Godzilla because there wasn't a lot of monster stuff, you're gonna be really disappointed with monsters. But it's great. But if you're the type of person <laughs> who likes good characters, right. monsters is right up your alley because that is, that's a good one. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I haven't seen the sequel though. I did. I've watched it a few times actually. It's garbage, but <laughs> giant monsters. So you know. <laughs> um, and and you're monsters. both right. <laughs> you're you're both right. Um, it it takes a director and a crew. The writing it takes people who care about what they're doing. Um, it's so obvious that you know Del Toro mm -hmm. and J.J. Abrams and Matt Reeves all cared about this genre because. You know, they, they looked to the past and then took their own spin on it. Um, and I don't think that uh, I don't as much as I criticize Godzilla King of the Monsters, I don't think that Michael Doherty doesn't care. No, I just that's what I was that just going to say. I was going to yeah. say maybe it's because that these are all their own universe that the studios can kind of leave them alone for the most part. Because, yeah, I, I know he's a Godzilla. Michael Doherty's a Godzilla fan. So any of the problem, you know, it, I think it's all studio stuff. The, the yeah. property's too big that they can't, you know, yeah. leave people alone. So. Yeah. You, you might be right. Um, you know, uh, he, Michael Doherty has gone on record as saying that there is a, a, a nearly three hour cut of yeah. King of the Monsters that exists. And the final film is only about two hours and 10 minutes. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, release the Doherty cut. Um, right. Right. I don't. Yeah, you know, I don't think we're ever going to get that. But uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, to add on to this too, like watching interviews with um, what's his name? I just pulled it up. Adam Wingard, who directs Godzilla versus Kong, you could definitely tell he's also a fanboy. And when I watched the movie, I got that sense because, like, even when I some interviews with him he's just like you could tell he loved giant monsters he loved Godzilla he loved Kong and all of that stuff so I highly suggest to people like this is like a very good film to check out I'm trying not to say too much about it of <laughs> course um I'm just trying to say like Adam he's also a fanboy and you see that in Godzilla versus Kong oh yeah um, for as much, again, for as much as I criticize King of the Monsters, you know, the moments where they're having a great time, it's, it's great, you know. Yeah. Um, just, just, you know, I, I would love to see uh, a general resurgence of the genre outside of Godzilla. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, we, you know, we only got, we only so far only only had one like real Cloverfield. The second two were, you know, sort of roped into the universe and aren't really monster movies but again check out 10, 10 cloverfield lane too it's so good yeah um we're actually they're actually uh working on a a proper cloverfield sequel apparently hmm. so that could be great um but yeah i mean like you know in the through the 50s and the 60s like you know western studios were also doing this hmm. ray harryhausen um was doing some incredible stop motion work there were there was the occasional hit with animatronics type movies like them was really good. Um, Gorgo, <laughs> yeah, Gorgo, mm -hmm. um, Gorgo is a good one. Um, you know, the only problem is that for all the good ones, there's also like fifty that are mm -hmm. like as Daniel would say, they're garbage films. Yeah, um, they're garbage. I I would even say too, like I think one of the biggest reasons why monster movies aren't doing as well now is that a lot of them I feel are um, baiting their audiences a lot like people want to go see giant monsters and these it's obvious the studios are trying to save money on CGI 
by focusing on human characters. And Adam Wingard, like I said, like who directed Godzilla vs. Kong, I think he even went on record saying like monster movies need less human characters. Yeah. And I think that's what's needed if we want to see more of a resurgence is like there needs to be a bit more monsters in your monster movies. Because like you said with Cloverfield too, it's just like they probably kept the pretty simple by having a bunch of new name young actors and i think that's a good way to go about it like get maybe like a bunch of new actors maybe one or two big names to bring people in but focus on the giant monsters and i think there could be a big resurgence in this genre i'm gonna disagree on that one i yeah i just am um only I, I don't know maybe it's maybe it's just a western thing it's got to be i think it's a western problem because yeah. you know daniel and i have seen all the uh, all the old films you know all of them up through 2016 and darn it all if like if the best ones don't you know they just they have they have that human element and they make it work yeah. um i've talked about Maltra versus godzilla a lot and you know the story in that one like absolutely works because of the human characters they yeah they put in it but like i i don't know what it i don't know what it's going to take for a western uh giant monster movie and you know i they really they really need to look to pacific rim i think and to mm -hmm. super eight and create a film that you know where the where the human element is important um but where the monster element is yeah. sort of also, they, they need to find a balance. They need to distinguish right. you. I'm actually going to agree with you on that, actually. Like, I'm going to take back that statement. I do think that's a good point because, like, I think, again, looking at the current MonsterVerse films, the human characters have never really been that great. So it's just, like, throughout them, you're always just, like, give us monsters. But because of the lack of the monsters, you have nothing to latch on to. Yeah. So I definitely actually agree with you on that. Finding that good balance of humans and monsters. But again, it's like, I think you need the right director who knows this genre, like Guillermo del Toro or J.J. Abrams or Matt Reeves. I was blanking on his name for a sec. <laughs> but, you know, we've also in, in, in the West, you know, apart from, apart from Marvel movies, like, some of the biggest movies that we've seen the last, you know, two decades, mm -hmm. um, we've been inundated with, um, why can't I remember his name? But, you know, we've been inundated with Michael Bay Transformers movies. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, those have kind of set the audience expectations of what giant robots and, and you know, by association, giant monster movies should be like. Right. Is, and, you know, um, in those cases, like the human element has, to, has always been, you know, a little silly and a little comedic, mm -hmm. um, even the military characters, you know, from what I remember of those first two films, it's like, those films just don't take themselves seriously. Um, I think Pacific Rim just, you're, yeah, it's, it's the one, it's the one that found that perfect balance of silly and terrifying and just awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know what, you know, it could, could, could mean we have to wait for another Guillermo del Toro kaiju film. But, <laughs> you know, in the meantime, um, if, uh, if, the, if the Godzilla franchise and Kong keeps going after Godzilla versus Kong, I'm, I'm happy that it at least could do that. I'm happy that it's gotten as far as it has because, you know, as, as we talked about before in, in one of these episodes, like, you know, the perception is that has, has traditionally been by non fans that oh this stuff is dumb, <laughs> right? Um, and actually a, a good friend uh, of Travis and mine actually sent me a, a link to Amazon bestsellers this morning, and in their, their movie bestsellers, uh, the first two Godzilla monster first films have uh, actually cracked the uh, top fifty, as well as the Criterion box set, which means that. Uh, People cool. have been watching Godzilla vs. Kong and saying, you know, one, I would like to go back and watch the first two films. And two, more importantly, I think they want to see, I think they want to see the original King Kong versus Godzilla. 
Mm -hmm. um, whether it be the American or the Japanese version. I think there's just been interest has drummed up in it, which is, which is great. Mm -hmm. So that's good. Um, let's, let's move on to trivia because we've been, we were talking a lot of final thoughts. Yeah. So many final <laughs> thoughts. They're really not, it's just like a final fantasy. It doesn't really end. Final, so, final, final thoughts. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so Pacific Rim, which we talked about so much tonight, is dedicated to the memories of Ray Harryhausen and which original Godzilla creator? Is it A, director Ishiro Honda, who also contributed to the screenplay, um, B, producer Tomoyuki Tanaka, C, special effects director Eiji Tsuburaya, or D, Godzilla suit actor Haruo Nakajima? Travis, I'm going to go your way first. Ah, uh, that is difficult considering, like, I just don't know. Like, um, I'm just going to say A, just because you added the little detail about how he also worked in the script or whatever. So just for that, I'm just going to quickly throw out A. It's a... Uh, it's like high school all over again. It's multiple choice. You got a 25% <laughs> chance. So just pick one and you have a possibility of winning. And the good news is I'm not going to hold you back a grade. <laughs> <laughs> you fail here. Um, Daniel, what do you think? I think it's suit actor because he died right about then, right? I'm trying to remember timelines. Yeah, I'll just go with Nakajima. <laughs> well, I think one of you got it right. He died right around then. So congratulations to Travis. It was writer-director ah, Ishiro Honda. You were, uh, your reasoning, though, Daniel, was not far off. Haro Nakajima passed away in 2017. So right. after, so he passed away after the first new Godzilla film, but before King of the Monsters. Okay. I think he actually saw um, Godzilla. Well, that's cool. And uh, and actually, he said, "I love this." Cool. Um, yeah, I think he was actually yeah because he was the of of those four, he was the last one. Right. Um, I can't remember. Ag Subaraya passed away, and I think it was in the seventies. Mm -hmm. You know, not too long after he started working in television. Honda, I think I think might have been either the eighties or nineties. Ultraman, <laughs> nice. Uh, Super Raya made it a long time. Like he was a producer all at least up through ninety five, yeah. through the first two series. I and I think he may have produced two thousand. He might have. I might mm -hmm. be wrong, but he he, you know, and not just or, or not Super Raya Tanaka, mm -hmm. Tanaka. Um, Tomiki Tanaka, and not just that, he produced like everything. He produced Mothra, Rodan, like he really was like the ultimate godfather of kaiju. Like, yeah, uh, him, him, and Honda and Subaraya. Like, without without them, we would not have we wouldn't have Pacific Rim. We wouldn't have we wouldn't be where we are. Nope. Oh man. Oh well, Travis, that puts you that puts you. Gosh, I can't I can't remember what the scores are at, but that puts you at least one ahead of several other people. <laughs> uh, so next week, we are going to talk about it. Yes, it has been out for three day three days now, but we are going to wait. We're going to give Daniel a chance to watch it. We're going to give you, the audience, a chance to watch it. Let it sink in. Read the review if you have seen it already and want to know what I think right now. I'm sure I'll have more thoughts. I will probably watch it again because you know what? It's just, it's right there. I can watch it on my TV real easy. Um, but hey, yeah, we are the Sunday matinee. Check us out at facebook.com slash truth and film at Twitter at Sunday underscore matinee. Oh man, I drank too much soda tonight. Um, <laughs> Uh, check out the blog, truthandfilm.wordpress.com. Um, hey, guess what? You're watching us on YouTube. You found us. Like, subscribe, blah, blah, blah. Send it. Send the word out. 
getting more people to watch this stuff because uh you know i want i want to uh and i love to get more people involved you know i love i love chatting about this kind of stuff not just monsters but with everything if you're just watching this for the monster stuff just wait until you see what i've got coming up after that <laughs> um Travis and Daniel, thank you for joining me on this bonus episode, episode 27, mm -hmm. the contenders to the throne. They will always be contenders. There are only, well, <laughs> whether you pick Kong or Godzilla, there is only one king. And on that note, everybody, <laughs> have a good day.